Hi, my name is Shana, and I am making this video to talk about my son Reeve's journey with mitochondrial dysfunction and cerebral folate deficiency, which um, are two conditions you've probably never heard of. I had never heard of them either. Um, but really, this video is not an informational video about those two conditions. This video is really about our journey in getting a diagnosis and a treatment and his path to recovery. Um, I was thinking I, I really wanted to make this video for a long time because I've talked to a lot of other parents who are on these journeys with their kids where they have very complicated, rare, um, unheard of conditions and the parents are going to all these specialists. Um, and I, I wanted to just make a video talking about our journey because I feel like, you know, um, doctors go to medical school and they study how to be a doctor for a long time. And I feel like patients go through something called patient school where you also learn to be a patient over a long period of time. And there is a lot to learn. And uh, it's been a very difficult yet valuable experience for me and if I could reach a family who might be earlier on the journey I just wanted to share our path in hopes that it might help them in some way. Thinking that the best place to start would be to talk about what Reeve was like when he was healthy before he got sick and then kind of go through our progression of symptoms over time and a little bit about the medical journey and then our learnings at the end. So with that I will begin. And I'll say he was born with Down syndrome, um, but he is a very healthy kid. He was nine pounds at birth. He came home with us right away. Um, he does have some delays due to Down syndrome, but he hit all of his major milestones, really not that far off of my other kids or of what a typical kid would um, do in terms of like being able to sit up and, you know, roll over as a baby or... Um, crawl and walk and run and jump. In some cases, he was ahead of my typical kids. Um, as a toddler, he had a ton of energy. He had incredible hand-eye coordination. He had this wonderful personality and a smile that would light up a room. Um, he was learning so many new things. He was potty training. He was learning his colors, his letters, his numbers, um, new words every day. And we had all indications that he was about to take off and just do wonderfully. Um, shortly after he turned four, he had this um, period in the summer where something happened and he was really sick. Um, he had a period of three or four days where he had these high fevers that would come and go, like 103, 104 temperatures. And he also started getting bloody noses all the time, which was a very new symptom for him. He had no history of bloody noses and he would just be sitting there and his nose would bleed or in his sleep, his nose would bleed all over the pillow. Um, so that was alarming to us. And then I would say the first time I felt really scared was a few days after the fever started. He had a day where he could not bear his own weight on his legs. We would stand him up and he would fall to the ground and he really could not walk at all. And I knew that something serious was happening. As I reflect back on this journey, I would say that when you are in the moment, it's really hard to know what is happening. It is um, a lot like the stock market where you might have a great day and you think, oh, okay, my kid's getting better. We're on a road to recovery. You have no idea that you're on this long-term downward trajectory that has good days and bad days. Um, it takes many months for trends to emerge and that was our case because even though Reeve recovered maybe the fevers went away and he seemed like he was getting better he never got back to baseline and we would see these patterns emerge of problems he would have he just not he didn't get better he was not himself anymore In that first in that first illness we had those initial symptoms that seemed like he was sick, you know? And he got better, 
but then he was always sick. Suddenly he started always getting sick. Um, it was always something. And what was really weird for us is that, you know, normally if you have a lot of kids and one gets sick, it's just a matter of time. It goes around the family. But none of the other kids would get sick. My husband and I wouldn't get sick. Um, we had an au pair living with us. They wouldn't get sick. It was just Reeve. Uh, Reeve would have fevers. He would have periods of vomiting. His skin would be really pale. He would develop really weird rashes that were never quite the same each time. Um, he had one issue uh, where all of his fingernails and toenails fell off. Um, he had very weird bruising sometimes and his skin would look very molted. Um, it was really hard to kind of put a name on these illnesses other than Reeve just always seemed like he was getting something that wasn't really contagious. So that was kind of one cluster of symptoms. And then the next, I guess, group of symptoms, I would say, were walking issues. So we had that initial one where Reeve could not walk couldn't bear weight. That seemed to get a little bit better. And then, you know, maybe a week later he was walking again, but then it would happen again. And he would be limping or sometimes he would be stumbling or sometimes he'd be shuffling around like he couldn't quite feel his feet. Um, he would walk on his heels. He would walk on his toes. He would stagger. Sometimes he looked like he was drunk. It was really hard for us to pinpoint what exactly the problem was because his, his gait was always abnormal, but sometimes abnormal in very different ways. Um, he also had a lot of joint swelling visibly to us. You know, his knees would be swollen. That would really stand out. And eventually he was diagnosed with chronic arthritis by a rheumatology team. Um, he had, you know, bony overgrowth on one of his legs. His legs were different sizes. Um, and you could just tell his knees look very sickly. Um, but that arthritis diagnosis didn't really explain some of the other symptom groups that I'll talk about. Um, but I would, I would just call this group of symptoms kind of like walking issues, gait issues. And it got to the point where by age six, he needed a medical stroller um, just to do things like go to the grocery store or if we were taking my other kids to the library, Reeve just couldn't walk anymore. He could walk around our house or very short distances, but if he had to go, you know, maybe longer than 20 or 30 feet, he would drop to crawl. Um, he would want to be carried. So walking became very challenging for him. Next cluster of symptoms I'm going to call movement disorders and we saw an onset of movement disorders and what I would call neurological symptoms that made me think something was going on in his brain because um, Reeve used to sit and feed himself like you know he'd sit at the table with us and eat a meal and then suddenly he seemed like he didn't want to use his hands anymore to feed himself. He would be hungry, like it'd be mealtime. He would definitely be hungry, but he would sit and kind of like turn his hands inward like this. And we would have to feed him kind of like a baby. Otherwise, you know, it, he just, he wouldn't be eating. And um, at the same time that this developed, he seemed to develop a sensitivity to light and sound that he didn't have before. So these little kid toys that make little noises, suddenly his brother would be playing with it or he would be covering his ears or shutting the lights off, which was not something he had ever done before. Um, he also seemed to have hallucinations where he was seeing things or trying to grab at things that were not there. And it was clear that he was seeing something, um, but we weren't seeing it. Uh, he also had what I started calling circle walking, where he would just basically pace back and forth in a circle for very long periods of time, maybe sometimes up to an hour, where he would just basically pace back and forth. He had never done that before. Um, in the original period where he had the high fevers, during that time, I had noticed he had some weird head posturing. 
and I had taken a couple videos of it because it just he just looked weird to me um, and at the time though I mean I, I could have been convinced that it was something else but a few months into this these head postures and head movements became so apparent that at times he almost looked like he had advanced Parkinson's disease or he reminded me of videos that I had seen of Michael J Fox where he was you know being interviewed and just could not stop moving his head or his eyes were darting left and right that's very much what Reef started looking like so these things that started off as just little odd head postures here and there became worse and worse and worse to the point where his head was bobbing all over the place um, Sometimes he would be eating and he would choke because of these just discoordinated head and eye and mouth movements that would happen. And it would take forever to feed him because we would have to like give him a bite and then wait for his head to calm down and then try to get another bite into him. Um, at the time we were giving him a lot of smoothies and trying to blend his foods really, really easy so he, he wouldn't choke, that he, he would barely have to chew. Uh, because it got that bad um, and also under this umbrella of like neurological disorders he would have very dilated pupils sometimes um, sometimes we would see him in these episodes that almost looked like he was having a seizure and then he would kind of come back to um, you know just so many symptoms that seemed like he was losing control of his brain and his body and he wasn't able to do things that he used to be able to do, which is very concerning. The next group of symptoms I would say were just overall cognition. So, so far I've given a long list of symptoms and even though it's a long list it's not even exhaustive there are literally so many things happening that just concerned us every day um, this illness impacted every aspect of his life but one of the saddest group of symptoms for us was um, what seemed like a loss of cognition and things that he used to be able to do or understand he couldn't anymore like we just put him back in diapers and there was no point in trying to potty train him um, because there he just didn't have the cognitive function to even understand that um, mm -hmm. it he would just look like his brain was shutting down and he was in la la land mm -hmm. he wasn't talking anymore um, we used to take him to the park. He would run around with his brothers. We would go now and he would just want to sit there. He would sleep all the time. Um, he had so much fatigue. He would nap three to four hours a day. He went to his therapy sessions and they had to put little 10 minute breaks in between activities so he could rest. And he just was not there. He was just far away somewhere. Um, and that was very hard for us to see. I remember one time I heard him laugh and I was, it, it struck me like, wow, it has been so long since I've heard him, his little voice laugh or smile or do anything because he was just so fatigued and run down all the time. So during all this time when this was happening, um, I want to make it clear we weren't just watching Reeve decline into oblivion saying like, oh, look, our son's sick. Um, we were actively taking him to doctors. We were booking so many appointments. And if there was such a thing as patient school, like there is medical school, I would really say that this is where our patient school education really began. Um, prior to this, we had been to doctors and hospitals, but I really did not understand how the medical system worked. Um, I also really did not understand how the medical system does not work. And I was just naive. And actually, when I think about what I thought now, it, it was stupid. I, I really thought, like, um, you scoop up your kid who's not walking and you skip into a hospital um, to the doctor's office and they're going to see that this is a serious situation and if they don't know the answers they're going to read a bunch of medical journals and call all their friends they know from medical school and help you solve this problem and get your kid back um, yeah that is not how the system works and i was foolish to think that is how it works um, 
as you know, if you're on this journey, your body kind of gets divided up into organ systems and there's specialists that look in your ears and there are specialists who deal with your blood. So many specialists. And you basically have to, even though you have something that encompasses your child's whole body, you have to just kind of go organ system by organ system and find specialists who might have an answer for you. And it's super frustrating because um, that's not how the body works and that's not how your life is working right now, but that is how the medical system works. And I, I'm really not here to dog the medical system because I don't know that I could design a better system that would let people go a thousand miles deep into a singular topic. Like not everyone can know everything about everything and there is so much to know. Um, I'm just saying this is how it is and I didn't know that's how it is till we were in it. And so, if I were to give advice to myself earlier on in the journey, um, it would be to think about each doctor's appointment as a date. <laughs> and the same advice I would give a friend who met someone online and they were going to meet them in person for the first time was go in prepared and read their profile ahead of time and find out what they're interested in so that you can have a really good date and you don't waste their time or your own time. And your expectations need to be fair. It's not fair to just walk into a doctor's appointment and expect the doctor to solve all of your problems and to drop everything they're doing and just be like solely focused on your kid. That would be great. And I'm sure some doctors do do that, but the good ones probably don't have the capacity to do that. And so if you're going to have an hour with a specialist, especially once you're getting into like the real nuances of your kid's condition and a specialist within the specialist community, um, you need to do homework. And I didn't do this at first, but it's definitely something that I started doing and started seeing the value in doing is that if we were going to a teaching hospital or a children's hospital that's doing a lot of research, chances are the doctor that we were going to see has published something or is studying something. And if I could download their PDFs or read a chapter of a book that they've written or watch a presentation that they gave at a conference, um, it would help me understand where they were coming from. And I could take that big brain of theirs with all this medical expertise and help them overlay it onto my kid's situation. Um, so for one example, you know, and some of these things aren't cheap. Like I bought a whole online book on movement disorders written by a particular doctor because I wanted him to help me understand how to look at Reeves movement disorders because they all had different treatments. And I wanted him to help me know like what makes it this versus that and when would you treat with this versus that. Um, I only had an hour with the guy and it helped tremendously that when I went in, he wasn't having to explain to me what is dystonia, what is chorea. Even though I couldn't really understand all these medical journals, at least I knew um, high level what the differences were and that there were treatment differences based on which condition it was. So another part of our education as patients was learning that there is a whole nother system outside of what I would call the mainstream medical system. And there are whole groups of providers, um, doctors, functional medicine doctors, naturopathic doctors, um, MAPS doctors, and it's a big mix. Some of them are MDs, DOs, NDs. Um, there's a lot of different types, but they're outside of kind of the mainstream system in that it's very unlikely you're gonna get a referral from your primary care physician to go see one of these people. And um, a lot of them are cash pay, which can be a barrier for people or overwhelming, but it is so worthwhile if you find a good one. And we really lucked out and found a amazing naturopathic doctor. Um, a friend of mine has a son with Down syndrome and referred us to the Pearson Center for Children, which is based out of Oregon. And there's a naturopathic doctor, Dr. Knapp, who we started working with. And she was so knowledgeable and it was so refreshing and so different to work with someone like this because we weren't we weren't going like organ system by organ system. But for once we were talking about Reeve as a whole and the things that we were seeing and um, talking about what could be the core root cause 
that connects all of this together. So that was very different and refreshing. Um, and I didn't know that existed before my friend referred us to him. So if you are a special needs parent and you feel stuck and you're in this place where you're waiting three months for the next specialist, I would say ask your your local mom's group or whoever you connect with in your community if they could recommend you to a good functional medicine doctor or naturopathic doctor. Um, I think there are some websites out there that list different providers and for this, I mean, I would really go word of mouth. It's so important to make sure you find a good one. Um, and just, I, I'm so disheartened sometimes when now that I know the expertise that lies in, in this, I guess, like alternative group, um, I hear them poo-pooed or it's, it's kind of talked down to or referred to as quackery or, oh, they're, you know, they're not MDs or whatever. These people are so knowledgeable. Like they know biochemistry. They know how the body works in ways that you don't hear <laughs> in, in like sometimes. And, uh, they can recommend things as like diet. I credit diet for solving Reeves arthritis problems. And we never heard that in a hospital setting. Um, we made changes that were very easy to his diet. Um, and like these things can lead to life changing things for your kiddo that are so helpful. So if you haven't checked that out yet, that was one big learning for us was just the different types of doctors that are out there that would not have crossed our radar had it not been for my friend suggesting it. In terms of medical appointments, putting your best foot forward often means coming in prepared. And if you've been to a number of specialists, chances are you already have a lot of lab work done. You already have a lot of things done. And if you can have a binder with your past lab results, that's super helpful. Um, I recently met a mom, uh, Shania, who is so organized. She has these binders and they're all labeled and everything. I'm not quite that organized, but when I did go to appointments, I would realize I needed to print off Reeves lab results and physically take it in there. And they would say, oh, maybe it's Hashimoto's. And I could say, actually, we tested for Hashimoto's two months ago, and it is not that. So can we move on to another idea? Um, being organized really makes it more efficient. And part of that, too, is being organized with your videos and your pictures. Um, we've had so many symptoms. As you can see, this video I've made is just a montage of little videos. And if you have an hour with a doctor, you don't want to spend 10 minutes watching a video. If you have a specific issue, try to use whatever like phone software you have to just take clips and make, make um, all of it into one video that you don't need internet connection for. Because sometimes I'd make a video and then you go into the hospital and your internet doesn't work. I started bringing in a laptop and it was like concise little video. So I, he's not watching Reeve eat for 10 minutes, but there is like a choking episode that's really concerning to me. I would just take out that choking episode and have the doctor watch it. Sometimes I watch these videos, sometimes they don't, but it's better to go in prepared. One of the biggest chapters in my education on being a good patient is also learning to say thank you to the good doctors. Um, you know, I didn't do this at first either, but I, I really started doing it as I started seeing the different kinds of doctors, not just in terms of specialty, but the different styles of doctors. And, you know, when I first went in, I wouldn't know if I was talking to a resident or an attending. Um, you start getting a sense of how that works, too, when, you know, you come in and you meet a very young, cheery, very confident person who tells you something. And then 10 minutes, a gray haired doctor comes in and kind of corrects everything that person just said. Um, you kind of learn who's a resident, who's an attending. And sometimes those who know the most are the most humble. <laughs> anyway. Um, Back to saying thank you. It's just so important when you see a doctor who's willing to help or wants to help and really cares that you take the time to appreciate that. Um, I try to think of what it must be like to be a doctor, especially with all the pressures and all the things going on right now. It is not an easy profession. And, you know, they might have like 10 patients before you and it can be very overwhelming and daunting and there's paperwork and just when they take the time and do something exceptional it's so important to reaffirm that that had value to you 
Um, one example I can think of is Reeve um, went to go see this guy we call Dr. Ben. He's an oncologist, and luckily we didn't need his services because Reeve did not have leukemia. But a few months later, Reeve got checked into the hospital in the neurology wing because um, we thought he was having seizures. And Dr. Ben saw it come across his radar, and he showed up to the neurology floor, which was so far away, I mean, on opposite ends of, his, of the hospital. And he came in, and he sat on the bed, and he's like, hey, I saw Reeves in the hospital. What's going on? Is there anything I can do to help? And, I mean, this wasn't even his territory. We were long done with him in terms of... Um, not needing his services, but it was so extraordinary. And once we finally did get a diagnosis for Reeve, I circled back to Dr. Ben and just let him know how the story concluded. And he was so appreciative to know that we finally got good care for Reeve. Um, you know, there have been providers who helped us get wheelchairs and maybe they didn't have all the answers. They weren't the doctor. They weren't the one we were gonna marry. But we had a really good date, and I appreciated that. And they didn't steer us wrong or set us back. Um, they gave us some good ideas that we acted on that maybe did reveal something. Maybe they suggested a lab that ended up helping. It's so important to say thank you to them so that when they have a bad day, we don't have the good doctors burn out and throw up their hands and say, you know what, screw this. This job sucks. I am just going to go live on a beach. We need to take care of our good doctors and you know, appreciate that they're human and um, hope that we get them when they're having a good day, but be a little bit more forgiving and gracious when they're having a bad day. Um, even the doctors who really steered us wrong, um, like I try to, to be kind. And one of the things that we would run into is because Reeve has Down syndrome, it's like such a big umbrella sometimes that to get a doctor to pay attention to this specific thing going on with Reeve, we have to get the Down syndrome out of the way. And if the doctor is not experienced in working with kids with Down syndrome, they might automatically assume that whatever the symptom is, is part of Down syndrome. You know, some doctors are just not experienced with it and, and they don't know. Um, I would equate it, actually, I would tell my husband, like, you know, in that appointment, it kind of felt like being a pregnant woman and walking into the ER with a gunshot wound saying, hey, I need attention, I'm bleeding. And they're like, oh, you need an OBGYN, you're pregnant. You're like, no, I'm bleeding. And they're like, yeah, sometimes, you know, women bleed during pregnancy, we'll get you an OBGYN. It's like, no, I have a gunshot wound. Sometimes it did feel like that. Um, but if they would tell me that this was part of Down syndrome, I, I would know that we were probably going to hit a dead end in this appointment. But following that appointment, I would send them whatever my most current research was, along with an email just saying, like, maybe you know something more current than this, but, you know, this is kind of the, the latest Down syndrome research, and I really don't think that this is what we're seeing. Um, you know, sometimes they would re reply, sometimes they wouldn't reply, but the advocate mom and me did not want them continuing to believe that something that's not part of Down syndrome was part of Down syndrome, because part of my advocacy for Down syndrome is being very clear that, you know, some things are in that umbrella, but when things are not, they need attention. Um, so that was very worthwhile, I believe. Reeve in particular, uh, what happened was we have a very caring, wonderful local neurologist. Her name's Dr. Burns. And even though Reeve had been admitted to the hospital, a different hospital, and had been worked up for neurology issues, they did not do a lumbar puncture. And uh, we were at a point, we were very desperate. She could sense that and she wanted to help us. So she helped us get into another hospital. We did a lumbar puncture and one of the labs came back very abnormal, and that was a low 5 methotetrahydrofolate level in his cerebral spinal fluid. Um, the report came back that it was consistent with something called cerebral folate deficiency, which was not a condition we had ever heard of before. And so um, we learned as much as we could about it, but um, Dr. Burns, even with that lab, she wasn't too sure about how to treat it because it's not it's not a commonly known, commonly treated condition. Um, it's very new in the terms of, you know, medical, as far as medical conditions go. So she sent us to some other neurologists who would look at the lab and they would recognize, okay, this 
this might be something, this does explain some of his symptoms, but we don't really know how to treat it. And so this goes back to like where our, our research came in and um, I got a bunch of medical journals on cerebral folate deficiency and I saw this doctor, Dr. Um, Richard Fry, who was publishing a lot about it. and was even doing clinical trials on a drug called leucovorin, which is folinic acid, where kids were having really remarkable recoveries. And what I liked about this treatment was it seemed so much safer than some of the other things that we were considering for Reeve at some point. Um, and so Dr. Burns helped us get our ducks in a row so that we could go see Dr. Fry, who was out in Arizona. So it took a few months for us to be able to go out there to see him. Um, Dr. Fry was really helpful ahead of the appointment. He would um, give me suggestions on labs to get done before we came out to see him so that we could make the most of his time. And when we finally got there, he did not disappoint me at all. Um, we had a nice long two hour appointment. He went over Reeves detailed medical history. Um, he really helped clarify a lot for me. I had been reading about cerebral folate deficiency to prepare for the appointment, but there were so many nuanced things that I just did not understand, and it was so nice to be able to have him explain them to me. I think having uh, watched his presentations and reading what he had written helped, helped that. So that goes back to that point about being prepared. Um, I would have hated to waste that time with like the expert of experts asking very basic questions. Um, at this point, I really wanted to understand the, the nuancey stuff. Um, one thing that had not crossed our radar yet that um, Dr. Fry recommended was that we work up Reeve a little bit more for mitochondrial dysfunction. Um, he suspected that some of Reeve's labs might come back as off and he called it correctly because um, we did that and Reeve ended up having elevated lactic acid and he had um, like homocysteine was off. I'm forgetting what all of them were, but they were some indications that Reeve needed a lot of mitochondrial support. And so in terms of treatment, um, we had started Reeve on oral leucovorin and then also injections. Um, they were little shots that he would get in his butt. And we were seeing some improvement. Um, Reeve was starting to talk again, and it just seemed like his cognition was improving. When we found out he had mitochondrial dysfunction, Dr. Fry recommended a bunch of supplements, um, some of them over the counter, some of them prescriptions, some of them compounded. It was a real tailored mixture based on the labs that he had ordered for Reeve. Um, one of the ones that I really credit Reeve's improvement um, for Reeves improvement was the neuro needs um, spectrum needs it's a powder and it has a lot of different vitamins in it and what was so nice and easy about it is that it tasted really good because we were used to having to shove things in Reeves mouth that probably didn't taste very good to him and he would spit them out um, but this neuro needs powder was really delicious I tried it and it just it went down very easily and so we could kind of use that as a base for a lot of the over-the-counter supplements we would mix it into a juice and he would just drink it um, once we introduced that that is really when we started to see his energy level come back online it was um, just like the the downward thing wasn't linear just like the upward trajectory wasn't linear either it's just we started having more good days than bad days, and that is what told us that Reeve was on a road to recovery. We really knew he was starting to recover when we heard him speak again, and not only starting to speak, but putting together two to three word sentences and saying words he had never said before. That was super encouraging for us. Um, Overall, Reeves' energy level picked back up, so he started walking longer and longer distances. He was still having a lot of um, hemidystonia, which was dystonia on the left side of his body. You would see a lot of like twisting, and he, he had trouble walking straight, and I think it was fatiguing for him to walk long distances still, but even that was starting to improve. Um, but basically like the little indicators like being able to play with his brothers again and going to the park and you know walking around the grocery store 
So we were very excited and encouraged and you know, he's, he's been on this process for about two years, still doing these meds and supplements. Um, he also takes like omega fish oils and ubiquinol carnitine. It's not, it's not a small treatment plan. I mean, there are many things that we give him every day. Um, he gets daily injections. It's, it's a lot, but it is so encouraging to see his improvement and to see him smile and laugh and just be a kid again. It, it is amazing. It's exciting for us. And I would say at this point, um, he's, he's not a hundred, 100 percent back without any symptoms. He still has some struggles, but he has way more good days and he's crossing milestones that he had not hit before his regression. So we are definitely moving in the right direction. So in conclusion, um, that's how Reeve's story is right now. I hope that's encouraging for some people. And kind of for the bigger message of this video, if you stuck with me this long, is just really um, don't be discouraged if you're on this long medical journey. Like we were really try to value each thing, even the setbacks as a learning opportunity for yourself, um, learning how to be an advocate. You're definitely going to be learning a lot of science you've never learned before. Um, be patient with that as well. There's a lot of medical terminology. Ask questions when you don't understand. Um, but the things you can control, do them. You know, Try to get as prepared as possible. Be as organized as possible. Keep good records. Keep good logs. Um, really thank the good doctors, the good nurses, the good healthcare providers who, who do things that are moving you in the right direction on your journey. You know, I even went back to the guy who used to draw Reeves blood at the lab because when you have a kiddo who's going to have to have his blood taken frequently, you don't want it to be a big traumatic event where they're so scared to go to the lab when you know you're going to have to take him to the lab every few months. And there, the guy who we went to um, was so amazing with Reeve. He could take vials and vials of blood and Reeve wouldn't even cry. Reeve wouldn't even flinch. That's a huge part of our medical journey. Even that, if that guy doesn't even know what he's drawing blood for or what condition Reeve has. I appreciated so much that he did not put trauma into, into our son um, for something that's gonna be an ongoing issue. So if you have that time, please do it. We need to encourage and value and cherish our good doctors, the ones who are really moving the ball forward, um, doing research and able to take their big brains and apply it in a way that is life-changing for us. I credit Dr. Fry with really connecting the dots and helping Reeve get his childhood back. And along with that, I really value so many of the doctors that got us to Dr. Fry um, Dr. Burns, Dr. Schulteis, um, Nurse Crosby, there are just the Dr. Ben who I talked about who sat next to us in the hospital. All of that is a huge part of Reeve's recovery and I am tremendously thankful for them.